In today's episode, we take a look at a conversation that I had with Dr. Eli from Aquabiomics. Now, if you haven't heard of Aquabiomics, it's a way of testing your reef aquarium's microbiome, and they use eDNA to test your water samples. Now, today's episode is part one of a four-part series where we break down what Aquabiomics is, how it works, how you send in your test kits and what your microbiome actually is. So let's go ahead and jump right in to today's episode. Diving right into it, uh, what is Aquabiomics for anyone that's new? Uh, yeah, yeah. so we're a, we're a brand new startup company um, offering the first DNA testing service for the aquarium. Um, and this, this testing service encompasses both the microbiome, that is the microbes that live in your tank, that's the bacteria and archaea. And it also encompasses uh, other organisms that live in your tank, things like parasites and nuisance algae. Um, so we have the microbiome test for the bacteria and the, the tank DNA test uh, for everything else. Gotcha. And so with these tests, you're able to, I guess, see into that world of like the nitrifying bacteria and beyond. So us as hobbyists, we know about the nitrogen cycle, uh, ammonia converts to nitrite to nitrate, but you actually can see bacteria that's responsible for that. That's right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's a great example of, uh, of the good kind of bacteria that we're hoping to find in your tank. Um, and that's one of the reasons to, to use one of these tests is to find out, do I have the microbes in my tank that I want to have in my tank in order to have a successful reef ecosystem? Um, and of course, the, the flip side of that is another reason to take these tests is to figure out, do I have any of the bad bacteria, the pathogens mm -hmm. that may be causing diseases for fish or corals in my aquarium? So the, the test really shows you just all of the microbes, all of the bacteria and archaea that are in your sample. Very cool. And so if you're uh, new to reefing or so, I guess, when would be a good time to send in a test, like right when you first set up a tank to get like a baseline um, or let it sit a few months or a year or wait yeah. till you see a problem or. Right. Yeah. It's a great question. You know, as the guy selling the test, I guess part of me wants to say, yeah, take a test every week. Right. But yeah. let's be honest, it, it costs some money and it takes some time. So, so let's think about how to, how to use the tool intelligently for reefing. You know, I think about it kind of like a blood test in, um, in human medicine. It's not something you need to do certainly weekly. Um, it's not something you need to do every day, but it is good to get one routinely. You kind of describe one reason for that is establishing a baseline. You know, if your tank is doing well and you want to know what does the community look like when my tank's doing well, go ahead and get, get a baseline. Um, and then later, if something's gone wrong in your tank, you can take another test and compare them and say, well, has my microbiome shifted into some, some uh, community that doesn't look like a healthy, uh, a healthy community? Um, so yeah, it's good to take one as a baseline. It's good to take one when things go wrong. Um, I'm not sure I'd recommend taking one the first day you start up your tank. Um, we'll, I'm sure we'll get into some of this, but the, the microbiome develops over time in a new tank. And I can, unless you're interested in doing an experiment, I can tell you right off the bat that on day one, especially if you've started with dry rock and, you know, sterile dry sand, you're going to have, you know, a very immature microbiome that's not ready. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wouldn't, again, unless you're doing an experiment, I wouldn't uh, spend your test on that day one sample. Instead, I would do something like wait a month or so until you think the tank is ready and then take the test to evaluate that question. You know, is, is my, is my reef tank microbiome mature? Uh, that that's actually something we can evaluate based on, on what we see in your test. Yeah. Cause there's, um, I know with bulk reef supply, they're testing multiple tanks and, right. uh, setting it up with dry, dry rock, live rock, um, live sand, all the different variables that go into setting up a tank and they're trying to see, like what's the best way to do it? Um, yeah. yeah, so that in their case, you know, we're taking samples all throughout the experiment, right? Because we mm -hmm. want to see that that change over time. And it's turning into a really nice data set on 
the development of, of the microbial community over time. It's great to have these data combined with all the videos that they're taking. So you can see that, you know, here's, here's what it looked like at the beginning and, and here's what it looked like you know, right. when it was mature. Yeah, absolutely. And so what's, what's like the goal of aquabiomics because you're collecting all this data. Um, how many tanks or tests have you taken so far or like, what's the, what's the end goal for it? Yeah. Um, well, so, I mean, to, to directly answer your question, the, the goal of aquabiomics is not primarily a research goal. It really is primarily to provide this service to the hobby. Um, Very cool. You know, I, I started off as a coral biologist. So I spent 20 years in academia studying a variety of different things, but always using DNA sequencing technology. Um, I kind of fell in love with those technologies early in grad school and carried them all through. And in, in my time studying corals, um, like many coral biologists, I kind of struggled with getting corals to grow well in the lab. Um, mm. I think your audience will appreciate that. You know, it's not an easy task to get corals to, to grow in an aquarium. It's not just a case of pop them in the aquarium and right. everything works. You know, and, and we had a lab at our disposal. We were measuring everything you're supposed to measure, right? Again, I think many of your listeners will, will, you know, uh, will sympathize with that experience. We, we in the hobby spend a lot of time measuring things like alkalinity and salinity and temperature. And, you know, we try to get everything right. And yet we have a tank where corals aren't doing well, right? That really was the motivation that drove me to develop this because I knew that there were other things we could be measuring. You know, I was using these DNA sequencing technologies and my colleagues were using them. And, and I knew that there was this whole world of, of um, you know, the, the marine microbiome that wasn't being measured in, um, in aquariums. And since the service wasn't out there for the hobby, it wasn't out there for me either as a researcher, right? So I said, okay, yeah. somebody has to develop this service. So that's, that is our primary goal. With that said, a part of the service has to be research because, um, you know, one of the great challenges to this kind of work is that most of the bacteria that we identify in your sample we won't be able to point to a specific paper that says, here's exactly what that bacteria does. Most of the bacteria in the ocean, most of the bacteria in your tank are, are not well described. Um, you know, we don't know exactly what all of them are doing. And so there's a lot, there's this big knowledge gap, right? We need to fill that, that gap in our knowledge. And the work we're doing at Aquabiomics is helping to fill that gap. Uh, really in collaboration with the hobbyist community, because you guys are the ones out there doing the experiments in the tanks in your living room. Uh, and, and we're just the ones coming in to provide the, the service, the, the DNA uh, testing service to, to help analyze your experiments. Mm -hmm. So we do have that additional goal of learning more about the microbial uh, community in your tank. And we can get into some of those, some of those details uh, today. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that's very cool because, um, in the hobby, like every tank is different. However, sure. there's a lot of similarities with right. uh, the, on the bacteria end. And we'll take a look at that when we look at um, the sample that I sent to you and take a look at the results. Yeah. Um, so very cool. So I just want to show this clip right here. Um, this is a clip of the tank uh, with some, some dinoflagellates in the tank uh, that I was battling. And I believe I sent the, the test off to you shortly after um, ga gaining control of the tank again, I guess, and yeah, gotcha. kind of fighting them back a little bit. Um, it's a beautiful shot of dinoflagellates, yeah. So I'm pulling up your test results. I, I can't recall which type of dinoflagellates we found DNA from. Yeah, it looks like it was amphidinium, which was mm -hmm. consistent with uh, what you were suggesting based on what it looked like under the scope. Huh? Yeah, yeah. And I, I used a just a small little handheld microscope, and this is the, the shot that I got of it. And based on some images I found online comparing the two, um, that's what I came up. Looks like amphidinium to me. So Cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm terrible at interpreting microscopy. I'm much better at interpreting DNA sequences. But at a DNA level, yeah, it certainly looked like amphidinium. Along with uh, with diatoms, which is something we often see in 
-hmm. in nuisance algae situations, um, it's often not, you know, a pure culture of a single thing uh, causing the problem in your tank. It's often a, a mixture of, of combination. Various, yeah. yeah. And, um, and in the case of, of my aquarium, um, it's about uh, a year and eight months old now. However, okay. it was set up with uh, water from a, a reef tank that was established for five years. Okay. Great. Um, so I basically just transferred all the water, all the rock and everything over to this tank. Yeah. Um, so I noticed with that tank, like, of course, day one, you put everything in, uh, once it, the cloudiness goes away from the sand, looks nice and pristine. And then mm -hmm. of course the, that those dreaded ugly phases come, comes back and, um, uh, cyanobacteria, dinoflagellates sure. out hair algaes, all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. is there a way knowing what a healthy microbiome looks like? Is there a way to kind of skip those phases or? Yeah, it's an important question. So, yeah, I think we've all encountered that, right? Probably in every tank that, that any of us set up. Um, my, my position is after having to set up tanks a lot of different ways and measured their microbiomes, my position is you, you can probably never avoid the uglies altogether. Um, we'll talk about why in a second, but I, I do think you can minimize them greatly by, um, by inoculating the aquarium with a nice diverse population of the appropriate bacteria. And it sounds like, it sounds like you did exactly that, you know, taking rocks and water from an established healthy tank is a great way to seed the microbiome in a, in a new tank. Um, the reason I say, I'm not sure we can ever avoid it completely is think about in a new tank, there are some surfaces that are truly clean. You know, whether it's the glass or the, the plastic pipes or pieces of sand that previously were not exposed, there's surfaces there that are truly clean. You know, they don't have a, a bacterial biofilm growing on their surface. And there's really kind of a succession process that happens on any surface when you put it into, into water, especially seawater. Um, different organisms start growing on it. And you go, you go through different phases, right? You go through the early phase of some organisms, some kinds of bacteria, and then different types of bacteria take over. Um, it's mostly invisible in the aquarium until you get to the ugly stages. And then you can see the, you know, the visible ugly nuisance algae. Um, so I, I don't think we're ever going to avoid it altogether because we, we're always going to have those naked, clean surfaces. But by putting the right microbes into the tank in the first place, it does seem we can greatly reduce it almost to the point where, you know, it almost doesn't happen. It's not a major problem in, in some tanks. Yeah. Very cool. And um, yeah. And so as far as the testing, um, I found it very easy, very straightforward. Cool. Um, uh, here is a video clip of me going through one of the tests, but um, yeah. So you receive, uh, if you're doing both of the tests, you get a box for either the microbiome or uh, the DNA. And um, uh, so again, what's the, the differences between the two? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the sampling procedure is pretty similar. Um, and this is, this is awesome. You have a great video of it for us to look at while we talk about it. Um, so for the microbiome sample, you're really, you're really taking two samples. You're going to take uh, a water sample and that's collected using the syringe that you're seeing there. And you're also gonna take a, a swab sample to collect the, um, the bacterial biofilm. In the tank DNA test, uh, there's just a water sample. There's no swab, we're just collecting DNA from the water. Now, there's another kind of hidden difference that as the user, you don't really see, but it's, it's happening in the filter. That is when you take your sample for the, the microbiome, your, your goal is really to capture bacteria and archaea, cells that are floating around in the water. And so you're capturing those cells and filtering them, pushing them down onto a filter. So the cells themselves, you know, here we are drawing the cells out of the aquarium, and then you're going to push them onto a filter and capture the cells. Uh, and it's the DNA in those bacterial cells that we'll be analyzing for your, your microbiome test. <clears throat> um, in contrast, the tank DNA, that test, it looks just the same when you're sampling it, but our goal there, it, it's actually a different filter. 
our goal there is not to capture cells, but rather to capture the DNA that's floating around in the water. So we use a DNA binding filter. It has bigger holes in it, so you can push more water through it. But overall, the process is very similar for both of them. You collect your water, you push it slowly, slowly through the filter. And thank you for showing this. This is great. You know, this is a challenge that I think some users have. Um, they try to push it through too quickly. And if you if you apply too much pressure, you'll blow out the seal and and lose your sample. So take yeah. your time with it. This this looks great. Um, could maybe even go a bit faster, but it never hurts to go too slowly. The goal gotcha. is to collect it without blowing out the. the yeah, because when you're when you're pushing down, there's definitely a lot of pressure getting it through that the That's tiny right. opening at the bottom for sure. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so that DNA that you're collecting, um, that's known as eDNA, right? Or that's environmental right. DNA. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. So in the tank DNA test, we're collecting eDNA, environmental DNA. It Most of it is actually dissolved DNA just floating around in the water. But there's also some chunks, you know, there's some cells floating around. There's some pieces of tissue uh, floating around. Um, and the... The microbiome test, in contrast, is is really analyzing bacterial cells themselves. Very cool. So I, I imagine that you find all kinds of things in there. You, you probably get this question a lot, like what's the strangest thing that you sure. found yeah. in the DNA sample? Yeah, boy. I mean, we find we find all kinds of stuff. You know, in the um, it's best to talk about that question in the the tank DNA test because the organisms we find will have you know names we recognize, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, we find in the tank DNA test <coughs> uh, all the animals that you would expect to find in a reef tank. We find fish and corals and snails and worms. Um, of course, none of those animals made it onto the filter, but their DNA uh, makes it onto the filter. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we also do find some strange stuff in there. Um, one thing we find in almost every sample is a human skin fungus with an unpronounceable name. Um, it doesn't really matter because it's not a pathogen. It's a, it's just a part of the community that lives on all human skin. Um, but if you look it up, it's like, yep, this is clearly a, a human skin fungus. Oh, wow. I, I sometimes, I sometimes think that if there's a human skin fungus researcher out there, they should get a hold of our database because we have samples of skin fungus DNA sequences from all over the country at this point. Interesting. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that that's a an example of something we find commonly that definitely didn't you know grow in the tank right it was a contaminant right. that got into the tank and another one like that we find terrestrial plants um one guy's sample recently had a whole bunch of cotton i i imagine it must have been a cotton field near his house you know pollen was probably blowing mm -hmm. it um, interesting so we we can identify not just oh it's a plant but here's the species of plant that we found in your tank um what other things? Occasionally, we find uh, terrestrial insects. You know, a, a spider or a, a bed bug. We found bed bugs in a couple samples. Hmm. Um, it's never, it's never a lot of the DNA, right? It's always a tiny, tiny fraction of the DNA. But yeah, we certainly do find, you know, odd contaminants. Um, yeah, and that's without even getting into the kind of unexpected marine organisms that we find from, you know, unusual invertebrates like bryozoans these show up sometimes um, uh, yeah um ascidians another another invertebrate group shows up sometimes so those are kind of unusual ones that show up um and of course there's unexpected parasites show up sometimes you know they weren't on the list that we were looking for in the hobby but we find it in the dna anyway and that's in my mind, one of the real great advantages of using this kind of technology for this, this application, if we were doing qPCR, which is the way everybody got COVID tested, you know, they did a they did a test on you to ask, do you have COVID? It didn't tell you if you had some other virus, it just gave you yes or no for COVID. But if you use DNA sequencing, you get to find out everything that's in there, whether you were expecting to find it or not. That, that just <laughs> fascinates me how much you can see with like a small sample of water. It's yeah, it's really amazing. Um, you know, they're using it in research. It it I was inspired to to branch out from the microbiome to tank DNA 
based on what they're doing in research. So they go out and sample from the ocean on cruise ships, you know, and they sample some water and they learn about the fish that are living in that part of the ocean. Like the ocean's huge compared yeah. to your tank. So if it works in the ocean, I figure, well, it's, it's got to work in a, a small body of water like your tank. So that's Aquabiomics. I hope you have enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to check out more videos, you can click on these right here. Remember to like, subscribe to the Coral Reef Talk for more content like this, and I'll see you in the next one.